some notes about some tips how you might solve some of the problems on the chapter 5 test in statistics. And this is a very important test because it involves probability distributions. Okay, so this <coughs> table shows us some x values and some probabilities. We need to check to see if it is a probability distribution. So all the probabilities need to be between 0 to 1, and they are. But the total of the probabilities have to, have to add up to 1. So let's just open it in Excel. And make that window a little bit smaller. And then let's zoom in on it a little bit more. Okay, so <clears throat> let's find the total of those four probabilities and see if it adds up to one. It does. So since they're all between zero and one and they all add up to one total, then that means that it is a probability distribution. Now it says find the mean of the random variable x. So to do that, we need to take the value of x multiplied by the probability of x. So the value of 0 only happens about 8.7% of the time. So overall, it only is actually worth 8, is only worth that much. The value of 1 happens but it only happens 34% of the time. So that value of 1 only contributes to the total expected value by that much. So we multiply the value, the actual value times the probability that it happens. Then the value of 2 happens sometimes, but let me type, type in equals. But the value of 2 only happens 41% of the time. So we're going to take the value of 2 times the probability of 0 0.414. And then we're going to take type in equals and then do the value of 3 times the probability that it happens, which is that. Now I'm going to show you a shortcut. Did you know you can delete all these and you can do it all over again in just an instant? Just type in equals into the first box, then click on the first x value, and then do times then click on the probability, and then push enter. Now once you've typed a formula that, and you're going to be doing the same formula over and over again, you just click back on that instead of typing the formula again. You click back on the original number, and then you move this mouse right over that little green dot, and then you click and hold down, and you hold down and drag till you get to the bottom of the lines you want to do the formula to, then let go. And the same formula will be done for all of them. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> when you add those numbers up, so type equals then sum, when you add those results up, that's equal to the expected value, or the mean. That's equal to the mean of the random variable. So the mean of the random variable is equal to 1.629. And it says round to one decimal place. So I'm going to round that off to 1.6. Then, now we have to find the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is calculated by first finding the deviations. Well, the deviations are simply equal to the value itself minus the mean value, like that. Now, when you subtract something, like that, and you try to click on that formula and drag it down, it does not work. Do you know why? It doesn't work. See, it doesn't, doesn't subtract anything from the 1, or the 2, or the 3. Why not? The reason it doesn't is because it's trying to take this box minus this box, and that works, but then it's trying to take this box minus this box, and then it's trying to take this box minus this box, and this box minus this box, but there's nothing in these three boxes. 
so it's not subtracting anything from the 1, the 2, or the 3. So how can you fix that? Well, go back and click on here and type equals. Now click on the 0, and then you do minus, then you click on the mean. But this time, after clicking the mean, push function and then F4 if you're on a Mac. If you're on a Windows computer, all you have to do is push F4. And what that does is that puts dollar signs in front of the red letters and numbers. So those numbers will not change. Now if I push enter and I click on this box and I drag it down, the formula works now. So let me look in at the details. If I click on this number, notice that the formula that it did was equal to 2, the blue box, minus the red box. And notice the C7 is always the same in every single one of those formulas. So when you push F4 after typing in a certain number or clicking on a certain number, that number will not change when you calculate it. Okay, now the next thing we need to do is square them. So, so, so square the deviations. So you take equals, then you click on the deviation, and then you do a power key, which is shift, and then six, then two. So you're going to click on that box, hold the mouse over the green dot, drag it down. <clears throat> so then we've squared them. Now we have to do um, multiply them by by the probability. So you type equals, click on the value that you just got, and multiply it by the probability. And then you click on that number, hold your mouse over the green dot, drag it down. Now you're going to add those up. So this is equal to the sum of all these numbers. And that's called the variance. And then we have one final step. We have to type equals square root of that number. Click on that number. Close parentheses. That's the standard deviation. So this right here is the variance. And this is the standard deviation. So that's the number that we want. I'm going to copy it and paste it right here. Run it off to one decimal place, so 0 0.8. Okay, something just happened to my um, <clears throat> file that I had open. So I can't see what Okay, just a second, I'm having trouble with my computer. Okay, so that's all. And that's the end of that problem. Now, in the second problem on your test, you have a, um, some groups of eight births from eight different sets of parents. So, um, the number of girls, zero, happened with that probability. That's like that, and that's like that. So, what's the probability of getting exactly six girls? That would be equal to, well, there's six, so the probability of that is zero point. 118. So exactly six year olds is 0 0.118. Find the probability of getting six or more girls. Well, the probability of six or more girls is equal to these three numbers added together. I mean, not those three numbers, but this, this, and this. So let's open it in Excel. Okay, let me just do this. It always opens it too big. And then it always makes it go super small. Okay, so there it is, the number of girls. And I'm not sure why it's not showing that. Okay, there we go. So what's the probability of getting six or more girls? Well, we just have to add up these three probabilities. 
So the probability of getting six or more girls is equal to the sum of the probability of getting six or more girls, which is equal to those three numbers added together. So 0.149. 0.149. Perfect. Then, which probability is relevant for determining whether 6 is a significantly high number of girls in 8 births? The result from part A or part B? Well, getting 6 girls could happen. At least 6 girls could happen in those three ways. So the answer in part B is the correct answer. So the result in part B is the relevant probability because it's the probability of the given or a more extreme result. So if you were wondering how likely it is to have at least six girls and eight births, this would be the correct number to look at. Is six a significantly high number of girls and eight births? Well, the threshold for being considered to be unusually high is if that has a probability of less than 5%. So this has a probability of about 15%. So that's not very unlikely. So is it a significantly high number of girls in eight births? No, it is not. Because it has a chance of happening that's more than 5%. So no, it is not a significantly high number since the appropriate probability is greater than 5%. Okay, now there is a 0.9988 probability that a randomly selected 33-year-old male lives through the year. A life insurance company charges $188 for ensuring that the male will live through the year. If the male does not survive the year, etc. So what's the value if you survive the year? Well, if you survive the year, what does that mean? So just a second. So if you survive the year, that means that you had to pay $188, right? So you lost $188, and you got nothing back from it, right? So the value of that is negative 188. And what about if you do not survive the year? Well, if you did not survive the year, then the value would be you lost the $188, correct? But you would have gotten $80,000 as a benefit. Your family would have gotten that. So you, you would have gained, I forgot what it said, 80000 So overall, you would have come out with $79,812 more, um, more than you started with. So, wait, I tried to copy that. It didn't work. Okay, so there we go. If you don't survive the year, then you come out with that much money. <clears throat> and so if a 33-year-old male purchased the policy, what's his expected value? Okay, well, this expected value goes back to what we did before. So what's the probability that you survive the year? The probability that you survive the year is equal to 0 0.9988. 0 0.9988. That's what the problem says. The probability that you don't survive the year is equal to 1 minus the probability that you do survive the year, which comes up with 0 0.0012. Now let's find the expected value, the same as we did before on the very first problem. We do that by finding the value of the outcome, which is called x, multiplied by the probability of that outcome. So we'll type equals, then the probability that you survive the year, times the probability of that, and then you get that. Down here we'll have equals, the value of that, times the probability of that, and then you add those together. So the expected value is equal to the sum of, well, uh, there's only two numbers, so I'll just do this number plus this number. I'll get negative 92. 
So the expected value is negative 92. And it says round to the nearest cent, so I'll type in negative 92.00. And then can the insurance company expect to make a profit? Well, yes. If they have a lot of policies like that, then on average, each person will lose about $92. So if they have enough of them, then all that money that the customers have lost will make up for the few customers that have actually had to have the life insurance be paid. So the answer is, yes, they can expect to make a profit. And the average profit will be $92 on every, well not on everyone, but on every average 33-year-old male that it insures for one year. All right, next problem. Determine whether or not the procedure described below results in a binomial distribution. So a binomial distribution needs to be two possible outcomes that always um, <clears throat> either always stay the same or that they come from a sample that's less than 5% of the population. Let's just check. So 700 voters come from a population of 4.5 million. That's much less than 5%. And then each is asked if they're a member of political party A, according to yes or no. And they're, the important thing is they're randomly selected. So that means that the probability is going to be the same, almost the same each time that somebody is picked. So this is a binomial probability distribution. All right. So it says, assume the method has no effect. So the probability of a girl is 0.5. And this is using the binomial distribution. The mean is equal to the sample size times the probability of getting whatever the outcome is. So the group is a sample of 19 couples. So n equals 19. And the probability of a girl is 0.5. So the mean is going to equal 19 times 0.5, which is equal to 9.5. So 9.5, because 19 times 0 0.5 from 0 0.5 equals 9.5. Okay, the value of the standard deviation, the formula for standard deviation of a binomial variable is square root of n times p times 1 minus p, which sometimes is called q. Okay, so that'll equal the square root of n, there's 19 couples, and the probability of a girl is assumed to be 0 0.5, Q is 1 minus P, or in other words, it's the probability of not a girl, which would be a boy. Well, the boy, probability of a boy is also 0.5. So the standard deviation is the square root of NPQ, which is 19 times 0.5 times 0.5. So if I do that, I'll get 2.179, but I have to round it off to one decimal place, so I would get 2.2. .2. Then it says use the range rule of thumb. Okay, so that means you take the mean, which is 9.5, and remember the range often tends to be equal to the low end of the range would be approximately equal to the mean minus 2 times the standard deviation. So that would equal the mean of 9.5 minus 2 times the standard deviation right there. So that works out to be about 5.14. And then the high end of the range is approximately, not always, but often, is equal to the mean plus 2 times the standard deviation. 
So that will equal the mean of 9.5 plus 2 times the standard deviation. And then I come up with 13.85. Now I'm going to round those each off to one decimal place. So this rounds down to 5.1. Low end of the range is 5.1. And this rounds off to be 13.9, 13.9. Is the result of 16 girls significantly high? Well, yes it is because it's more than 13.9. In nearly all cases, the number of girls should be somewhere between 5.1 to 13.9. So 16 girls is definitely much above that. So that result is significantly high because 16 girls is more than 13.9 girls. Is greater than 13.9 girls. The result of 16 girls would suggest that the method is effective. So the method is designed to increase the likelihood that each baby will be a girl. So since this method has made 16 girls happen, then that means the method is effective in helping more girls to be there. Because it says the method is designed to increase the likelihood that each baby will be a girl. Which it seems, to, so it seems like it does increase the number of girls. Okay, so now the probability of getting the first success on the X trial is given by that. This can sometimes be a very important um, formula. Okay, so find the probability that the first subject to be a universal donor is the eighth person selected. So let me show you how to use this formula real quick. P represents the, prob the probability that someone is a universal donor, which is 0 0.04. That represents this P, right? Well, you can't select it for some reason, but that represents this P right here. Then, multiply that by 1 minus P, so 1 minus 0 0.04, to the power of X minus 1. A X is... <coughs> the number of which the person selected is going to be, which is the eighth person. So it'll be to the power of eight minus one. So we can simplify that. So it's 0 0.04 times one minus 0 0.04, which is, point, which is 0 0.96, and eight minus one is seven. So the formula we need is 0 0.04 is equal to 0 0.04 times 0 0.96 to the power of 7. 0 0.04 times 0 0.96 to the power of 7. So the answer is that. Round that to four decimal places. So 0 0.03005. So since the next digit is 5, this is going to round off to, going to round up to 1. So 0 0.0301. That's the probability the first subject is the eighth person selected. Okay, so in a recent year, a hospital had 4,211 births. Find the mean number of births per day. So the mean number of births per day, that's just equal to the total number of births, 4211, divided by the total number of days in a year, which is 365. So the mean number of births is 11.536, which rounds off to 11.5. So 11.5. And then the probability that in a day there are 14 births. This is the Poisson distribution. So we're going to click on Question Help, then select Stat Crunch. Then click Stats, Calculators, and choose the Poisson Calculator. 
Now what we have to do is the mean number of births is 11.5, but I'm going to be even more accurate though. I'm going to tap in that, 11.536. All right, now I want to find the probability that there will be 14 births in a day. So change this to be equals, and then type in 14, then click compute. So if the mean is 11.56, if the mean is 11.5369863 births per day, then the probability that there will be 14 births per day is 0 0.08, etc. All right. So now round that off to three decimal places. So there's the third decimal place. Now, since there's an 8 after the third decimal place, that means this is going to round up to a 3. So 0 0.083. And this means that is more than 5% chance. That's about an 8% chance. So that means that it is not unlikely, it's not unlikely for a day to have exactly 13 births because the probability is more than 5%. Because the probability is greater than 0 0.05. It's not unlikely for a day to have exactly 14 births because it's a probability greater than 5%. All right. Okay, now let's think about this one. Whoops. Okay, so data from 14 cities were combined. So in 14 cities with a 20-year period, that that's a total of 260 years worth of data. I mean 280 years worth of data. So in all those years, the number of homicides was 89. So the mean number of, homi of homicides per year is equal to the total number of homicides, which is 89, divided by the total number of city years, which is 280. So that's how many homicides happen on average per year in each city across all, across all 14 cities just considered as an average group. Okay, now let me enter that in. So the mean number is 0 0.3178. Okay, so I'm still working with the Poisson calculator now that I still have open from the last problem. Then I need to find the probability of zero homicides. So what's the probability that you have exactly zero homicides? That's equal to that. So I, type, I do the probability equal to zero, and then I click compute, and then I get that probability. And then I round that off to four decimal places. So 0 0.7277, 0 0.7277. And since the next decimal is a zero, that will stay the same. Then the probability of one, so change this to be equal to one, then click compute, then you'll get this number. Round that off to four decimal places. Then go back here and type in two. Copy that, then round that off to four decimal places. Now notice this one, after four decimal places, it has a six. So that seven is going to round up to an eight. And then change this to be the probability of three. You get that. So after four decimal places, that has a nine. So the 38 is going to round up to 39. Then the probability of 4 is equal to that. So after four decimal places, it has a 0. So that's going to stay the same as it is before in those four decimal places. OK, then the actual results consisted of 203 city years with 0 homicides, 66 city years with 1 homicide, 10 city years with 2 homicides, 1 city year with 3, and 0 with 4. So notice the most likely outcome is to have zero homicides, just like this shows. Then the next most likely outcome is 60 is to have one homicide. So for example, you can actually calculate the probability that you would actually have 36 by doing this. So 
the observed probability of having one homicide per year as observed is equal to the number of years that it happened, which was equal to 66 divided by the total number of years in the data sample, which is 280 years. So then you get 66 divided by 280, which is 0.2357. That's almost exactly the same as the probability that was calculated by using the Poisson formula. So sometimes by using the Poisson formula, you can calculate the probabilities of something even if you don't have the actual individual data. So we calculated all four of these answers with the only thing that we actually knew when we calculated them was just the total number of homicides and the total number of years. We didn't actually know how many, in, how many individual homicides had actually happened, but we still calculated the probabilities of them very, very accurately. So the question is, does the Poisson distribution serve as a good tool for predicting the actual results? Yes, it does. The results from the Poisson distribution probabilities closely match the actual results. All right. In a recent year, an author wrote 187 checks. So a year, so what's the average number of checks per day? So the average number of checks per day is just equal to the total number of checks, 187, divided by the total number of days in a year, which is 365. So that's the average number of checks per day, and that's the value that goes into the Poisson distribution. So the mean value per day, or the average value per day is called the mean, and that's 0.512, etc. Then it says, what's the probability that you wrote at least one check? So the probability that you wrote at least one check is equal to the probability that it's greater than or equal to 1, like that. So the probability that you wrote at least one check, in other words, greater than or equal to 1, is equal to 0 0.4009, etc. So 0 0.4009 rounded off to three decimal places. Well, notice after three decimal places, you have a 9. So I need to round that 0 up to a 1. And then that's the last question on this test. And I hope that helps you as you are studying for taking your Chapter 5 test. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful day.